right, man, that is so dynamic. I tell you, I love that. I, I love that. My hands are open. My heart is free. Yeah, my open the heavens, rain down on me. I love that. I love that, the, 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 the picture of fall. You know, it's like fall down on me like this. That's just, I, I, I love stuff like that. It, it really blesses my life. It really makes things where, you know, you can feel them in, inside of you. I love the part it talked about, about change in there, uh, for those of you that have the outline. Those of you that are watching, by the way, I know many of you receive the outlines. I send you an email uh, before Sunday every week, and you have the outlines uh, that we hand out here at church for anyone who wants it, who picks it up on the outside. If there are any others of you out there that would like to have, or like to get an outline, um, just contact us. We do where, oh, through Facebook or, or our website, uh, and you can get some emails. Say, hey, I'd like to get one of those kind of deal. Uh, I think it's helpful. I, I try to put things in there to help you out. Some of the things that are in there, I, I don't always preach everything that's in there. Usually most of the points that are there I do, but not, not a lot of the information and stuff like that. We'd be here for hours. But anyway, uh, I want to talk to you about change today because seasons change and times change, not just a time change like today, a spring forward an hour. But times, you know, the old phrase, times, they are a changing, and they always are. And nations change, and technology changes. I mean, in, in our personal lives, uh, marriages change. Our ministries change. Financial situations change. And there's a need for change in our life. God never changes, of course, because he doesn't need to. He's already perfect. So there's no need for God to change. But us, on the other hand, there's always a need for us to change. And God is always in the process of changing us. He says the way he does it is from faith to faith, in the book of Romans, Paul says, chapter one, that we move from faith to faith, which just simply means when we use the faith that God has given us, he gives us more. So the more we use our faith, the greater our faith becomes because God moves us from faith to faith. And then here in a passage we're gonna read in just a moment in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he moves us from glory to glory. And that's how God changes our life. And that's how God moves us because uh, we're always in need of release and growth and, and, and life. And so God moves us this way and he's constantly doing this from the moment we trust him until the moment he takes us home <laughs> It, things in our life are changing. Let, let's see how the, the Apostle Paul talks about change. He's, and in this passage now, he's discussing, we're gonna drop in right in the middle for a couple of verses out of a, a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter three, that, uh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter three, where the Apostle Paul is discussing the differences in the old covenant and the new covenant. He's talking to Israel about what the old covenant was and, and, and now the new covenant. And, and he's just talking about how they work differently. Let's look at verse 17, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the spirit. He's been talking about the spirit. So he now says, all right, the Lord is the spirit I've been talking about. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, which is a Greek word, el lutherio, which just simply means um, I have the option to choose some things or to release some things that have nothing to do with salvation. That's what El Lutheria means. It means not things concerning salvation. You don't get a chance to release different ideas and things about that. The Lord says, if, if you come to me, you, you're gonna come to me on, on the terms I laid down and you're not adding anything to it and you're not taking anything away. 
but on many areas of life that don't have anything to do with, your, with the relationship of salvation, you have liberty. You have El Lutheria. You have the option to save some things, bring some things in, or remove some things. God, he's just saying God has given you choice. And you still have a choice about everything you do in life, even when you get saved. You don't have a, cho a choice about how you come to Christ. You have to believe by faith to come to Christ. But uh, there are a lot of other things that are just completely the choices that you want to make in your own life. But, verse, 16, verse 18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. Well, well, pastor, I don't look like Jesus. Well, God's not finished with you yet. Everybody say, God's not finished with me yet. Right. I know you don't look like Jesus. That's why you need to change. That's why he is changing you from glory to glory and faith to faith so that you will look like the image of Jesus. So he's being transformed into the same in image from glory to glory. And I just want to make a tiny point here to notice that even when you start, when you first get saved, where you start from, you start from glory. At, right off the bat, you are glorious. And you move to levels of glory as you move through, just as by the Spirit of the Lord, the Apostle Paul said. Now, I know in verse 18, the first verse there about at the, at the beginning of, of the of first of the verse about unveiled face, we're being transformed. And of course, you understand the word transformed because I've preached about it a lot seemingly in the last months. Seems like I find myself mentioning that word to you quite often. Maybe it's just the way the Lord's been leading in our lives, all of our lives, but it's our old Greek word metamorpheo, which simply means uh, to be, to be uh, not made new in the sense that of brand new, but changed, made new. Like, like a butterfly, metamorphosis is the English word we have, which is a butterfly and caterpillar is the greatest example of that. I mean, when a caterpillar goes into the cocoon, he is transformed into a butterfly which is a completely different creature than he went in as. But he's not brand new because he was a caterpillar when he started, but he has been made new by the experience of the cocoon. And this is what he's talking about. The Lord transforms us. We're made new by him. So ask yourself the question, what area of life do I need change? In. Or what, what area, area of life do I, do I want to change in? Because we've learned from Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son, who went out and spent all dad's money and riotous living, came to the end of all of his money, came to the end of all of his friends. They said, go down and feed pigs. And he's looking at the slop saying, wow, whew, that looks good, man. Is there some corn left on that cob? And he wants to eat that stuff. And the Bible says this, and I'm, I mean, and I'm not paraphrasing, this is exactly what it says. And no man gave him anything. And the next line is, and he came to himself. Implying that if somebody had brought him a, an RC and a moon pie, he would still be in the pig pen. But nobody gave him anything. And when they did that, he came to himself. And when he came to himself, he said, I got to get up out of here. Man, this is a horrible place. This is a horrible life. And I don't want this anymore. But it only happens when he sees himself the way he is. So the reason I ask you, what is it that you want to change? Is because you're not going to change anything until you first of all see the fact that you need to change. Because change starts right here, and then it proceeds out from here. I mean, it may be your financial situation. It may be your marriage, your educational status, your relationships with other people, your Christian life. God says, if you're longing to change, 
that I'm ready to bring you from glory to glory. It's like the old affirmation that we used to say, you know, a lot of times. Well, I'm not what I want to be, and I'm not what I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I was. And this is what God does in our life. So here in the third chapter of 2 Corinthians, Israel is the subject. And if you read the chapter, you will find out that it reveals that a hardness has come to Israel, that a, that a, that a, that a blindness has come to Israel as a nation. The implication, of course, is that at one time, they were filled with the glory of God. At one time, they were miraculously used by God. At one time, they were the movers and shakers with the power of God and the Spirit of God. But now, something's happened to them, and they are now hardened, and they're now blind. I mean, when they first left uh, Egypt out in the wilderness... The first thing that happened to them is the Red Sea parts and they walk across on dry ground. And then they don't have any water and Moses speaks to the rock and, and water comes out of the rock. And then they don't have any food. And so every night God brings the quail in. At twilight it said, he brings the quail in. And in the morning they wake up and there's this dew on the ground out in the desert. And when the dew dries up, there's this substance there that they didn't know what to call it. So they just said manna. Now, manna is not a word. I mean, manna is not a, a title. Manna means what is it? That's what manna means. But it's been come, it's, we call it manna because we don't know what to call it either. I kind of think like angel food cake or something like that, but, but it, it, it doesn't even have as much taste as angel food cake. It said, bland, they, the Israelites said, this bland stuff, you know, but it kept them alive. And God did that every morning and brought the quail in at twilight. There was a glory cloud that went with them in daytime, like a giant supernatural canopy that kept them from being burnt up by the sun out in the desert for all of those years. And then at night, when it gets cold on the desert, God put a pillar of fire at the edge of the camp and blew the desert wind through it like a giant supernatural heater to keep them where they wouldn't freeze at night. Man, I call that some glory. I mean, I don't know about you, but that is some glorious stuff right there. And when they got to Mount Sinai, the top of the whole, whole top of the mountain glowed because God was up there with Moses writing some Ten Commandments and cutting them out of the stone and giving them to Moses. And when Moses came down, his face glowed so much he had to put a rag over his face. Man, that, that, that's, that's, that's pretty good glory, I say. But the problem was that they never moved on from that. Even today, if the Israelites read the Old Testament, it, they just become more hardened by it. They never see that that former glory has passed away and that they have now become hardened, uh, another word, petrified. It's a good word for it, petrified. Because you know how something becomes petrified, right? It's something that was alive and it dies. And then it lays in one spot so long, it becomes hard like, like, like a rock. And that's what happens in our life. That's what happens in our relationships. That's what happens in our families. That's what happens in our, in our careers and in, 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 in our marriages. You allow it to stay in one place too long and it petrifies. It hardens itself. Now think, I mean, think about all the great moves of God. I know you guys are not uh, religious scholars or anything about, and you probably haven't studied the great moves of God. But surely you've heard of some of them like, Surely you've heard of the Protestant Reformation, right? I mean, uh, that started the Protestant movement. At one time, the whole world was either Catholic or a little small, tiny bunch called Anabaptist that they fed to the lions and used for sport and entertainment in the Dark Ages. Well, God broke the, the, the theological world from that in what is called the Protestant Reformation, the great, one of the greatest moves of God that's ever happened. 
or the great awakening. Maybe some of you that read a lot of, uh, of, uh, of spiritual things have read about a preacher named, an old preacher named Duncan Campbell that went to the Hebrides and, and a revival broke out in Scotland and Ireland and the Hebrides. And I mean, it was just worldwide. Brother Duncan, me mother and me father and me sister and me uncle. Uh, that's the way they talk over there. <laughs> and then our, our Dwight Moody and the YMCA. YMCA. Young Men's Christian Association. You'd never recognize it, would you? It was a great movement. It was a Sunday school class on the streets of Chicago where little urchins, street urchins, would come and trust Christ. It was like a big youth committee. What about Azusa Street out in California at the turn of the century? One of the tr most tremendous revivals that have ever been reported happened at Azusa Street. And then what about the Jesus Movement? We, I, I was part of the Jesus Movement. Maybe you were part of the Jesus Movement. Did you put on your sandals, grow your hair long, and, and walk around with a bi psychedelic Bible in your hand? I mean, the living Bible became the living Bible and the Jesus movement. Pat Boone and people baptizing in the pools out in Hollywood. Or the Toronto Blessing that was reported all over the world. Or Brownsville down here in Pensacola. All of these great moves of God have now petrified into status quo organizations because they all have camped around former glory. It used to be glorious. It was wonderful. We got all we need. Let's stay here. Glory to God. This is the most wonderful thing. We don't need anything else. All right, God, this is it for life. We're right here. And you, and you camp around former. And you get petrified. It just happens in life. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes, like I mentioned before. He doesn't need to because God is already perfect. But you and I need to move in our life, change in our life from one level of glory to the next level of glory. And that's what God's in the process of doing to us if we will go with him. I like, I like the way pa the Apostle Paul talks about this. I want you to listen to the Apostle Paul talk about this and think with him just a second as he talks about change. And, and in the next chapter, chapter four, he uses himself as an example. And he says, all right, I want to talk to you about change. And I want to use myself as an example. And so here's what he said about himself, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, starting verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are, listen to what he says, we are hard pressed on every side. Have you ever been hard pressed? <laughs> It's tough. It's, it's not pleasant. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, which means I don't have an answer. I mean, have you ever had a situation you don't, you don't have an answer to? I mean, you, there's not an answer to be had. That's perplexed. I've been perplexed, he said, but not in despair. I didn't worry about it. It didn't bring me way down. And then he said, persecuted? Have you been persecuted? <laughs> uh, have they gotten you to take the vaccine? <laughs> persecuted? Fired? You don't have a job anymore? You're ostracized and everything else? Yeah, that's just a, a mild form of persecution. But not forsaken, he says. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Paul is saying, hey, I'm suffering. I am 
hard pressed. I am perplexed. I am persecuted. I'm struck down. I'm caring about the dying body of Jesus in my body. I'm suffering. It's tough for me. But this is God's tool. This is how God is moving me from glory to glory. This is how God moves our life from one level of maturity to a next level of maturity. So, do you want to change? If you want to change, you need to meet your enemies. And here are five of them. Five enemies of change. These are the enemies that will assault you as you move forward in change in life. Now, not just spiritual change, but especially spiritual change, but any change. Anything you want to do in life that's going to change you, especially for the better. Here's the first one. The first enemy that you face is called tradition. The glory that was. Now, I want to uh, place a disclaimer right here because I know that most of us are older. And when anybody starts talking about tradition, we always want to get our feathers ruffled and say, they're talking about us. They're talking about the way we do things. We're talking about our church. We sing hymns. We we don't clap. We don't dance. We sit in our place. We say amen. We, I mean, traditions, traditions. And And so the disclaimer is, I'm not talking about all traditions. I'm not saying that everything traditional is bad. There are lots of good traditions. There are lots of things that are wonderful blessings. And everybody needs some traditions. And families need some traditions. They just make life better. But I'm talking about that sense of I have arrived and I'm going to hang on to these old ways instead of moving on to any new stuff. Because that's the way I am. That's the way daddy was the way granddaddy was, the way I am. Let me show you what happens with this. this isn't, I mean, this is very subtle, but, but watch. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, I'm going to read from the New Living Testament because if I read it from the King James, I would spend the next hour explaining it to you. It is a very confusing passage of Scripture in the, in the King James because of the sentence structure and the way it says. But I promise you, this is exactly what it says. This is just a, 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 this is a translation that says it in a more contemporary way. Not a paraphrase. It's a, it's a translation. All right, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. It'll be on the screen. The old way with laws etched in stone. Everybody say, Ten Commandments. That's what he's talking about. The old way with laws etched in stone led to death. You know why? Because nobody could keep the law. So the law killed everybody because nobody could keep it. The old way with laws etched in stone led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Yeah, it was glowing bright until he came down and got with the people, and in a few days with the people, it all went away. Verse 8. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way which brings condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way which has been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? That's a good argument, isn't it? Um, God moves in certain ways. God manifests himself in certain, in certain ways. He, uh, he, he shows his glory in, in, in different ways as he moves with us. And with Israel, instead of, uh, instead of rejoicing in that God was getting ready for the next revelation of himself, they just said, hey, Let's just stop and camp right here because the glory that was <laughs> is good enough for me. This is why we miss the favor of God. 
let me talk to you about this just a second. When I talk about favor, I'm talking about God's direction. I'm talking about God's provision for his direction. If he moves you in a direction, he's going to make provision for that. Whatever it takes for you to be able to accomplish this, it's going to be true in your life. We call that God's favor. T.D. Jakes has the famous slogan, favor ain't fair. <laughs> you name it. God gives you stuff. He doesn't give other people because he's moving you in a direction and you're moving and so he gives you favor. You know what keeps us from getting favor? Sticking with the familiar. We stick to the familiar so tightly that we won't move on with God. I mean, think about it. Some, I don't want to, I don't want to be judgmental, but I'm, I guarantee you that somebody watching us and somebody in here, somebody out there has stuck with some situation in their life that, that they know is long been gone. Some dysfunctional junk, some dysfunctional friend, some person in your life that is just terrible. And, and, and you just hang on to that instead of moving on to some new people that have a better relationship to you and a better relationship with the Lord because you can't let go of that past. That's comfortable to you. That's comfort food back here because you remember how you guys used to be so tight and so good and so free. They were so faithful and all that. And they're killing you. They're killing your life. They're killing your relationship with God. They make it much more difficult to love God and walk with God and move with God. But I guess the idea is the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. So let's just stick around with all this stuff we've stuck with all of our life because, hey, at least we know it. That's holding on to the glory that was. And when you do that, it keeps you from moving forward with God, which releases God's favor in life. Maybe it's a terrible job, you know? Whew. Maybe it's a dilapidated house situation or whatever it might be. I mean, it could be anything. And that's the very attitude that Jesus attacks in the, in the parable of the new wineskins. You might not remember it. I'll just hit it light. Jesus said, you don't take a new piece of cloth and put it on an old garment. Because if you do, when you wash it, the new stuff's going to shrink up and it's going to separate itself from the old stuff. Then he said, you don't take new wine and put it in an old wine skin because the old wine skin is, is tight. It's already stretched as far as it can go. And you put that new wine in there and it's going to ferment and expand and it's going to blow the whole bag up and you're going to lose everything. And then this is the last little line he says. And most people don't even think about this line, but listen to this. This is in Luke 5. Uh, I think I put it in the outline. I don't think it's up here. I don't think I have a scripture up that you can show, nay. Luke 5, 39 is where it is, though. And here's what Jesus said. This is the last line of that little parable. And no one, listen to this. Now, he's describing humanity here. This is, he's talking to all of us. Every one of us are like this. This is the way humanity is. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. None of us, looking at the comfortable old way, old style, old people, old life, old looks at it and then looks at something new that's unknown or, 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 or uncertain, uh, has some risks, uh, and, say, and, um, and immediately we say, uh, 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 let's go new. No, we're going to go, uh, 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 let's go, let's stay where we are. That's the way humanity is. And that's what we have to fight. Because, not because we're weak, but because we're humans. The seven, <laughs> seven last words of a dying life is what? We've never done it this way before. We've, we've done it this way for a hundred years. And if it was good enough for Paul and Silas, bless God, it's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, that's our attitude. I know you've heard about the woman 
who kept cutting off the end of her ham. And her family asked her, Mom, why do you cut off the end of your ham? She said, well, my mother cut it off and, then, and, and, and her mother cut it off. And there must be something that makes the ham taste special when you cut the end of it off like that. Why don't you go ask her? So they found old great, great Grams, and they said, Graham said, uh, why you cut that ham off uh, like that every time? He said, uh, does it make it taste better? Is there something special about that? She said, no. She said, there's nothing special about cutting the end off that makes it taste better. She said, I cut the end off because the pot was too small. <laughs> Everybody say, tradition. That, that is tradition. We get bogged down in it. It keeps us from going to glory to glory. It keeps, and the Lord's always moving us. And I don't want to get bogged down in traditions. And so here was Israel, receive the law, receive the tradition. They shut down and said, okay, now we got the law. That's good enough for us. That's God. We're not going to. Right now, right now, 6,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 years later, they're still petrified, hardened, blind even. Second enemy, fear. You've not passed this way before. Mm. Change always brings anxiety, doesn't it? Because, well, I mean, let's be honest, things might not work out. Hmm? So we're nervous about it. We're anxious about it. We got a chance to fail. With change comes the possibility of failure in life. Here's Joshua chapter 3 with Israel, beginning at verse 2. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priest and the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. So follow the ark, or what they're saying. That was that box that had the commands that had been broken in the pots of manna and the Aaron's rod, the high priest's rod that budded. That was where God lived with Israel, the ark of the covenant. When you see the priest get it and start moving with it, you just start following it. That's what the instruction is. All right, hang on. Verse four, yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it. That's good advice. You've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Okay, I'll rest my case. That you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Israel always had Moses. Moses was Israel's comfort food. Moses, Moses was always there. He had led them all these years, and now Moses is dead. And God has brought Israel back to the, to, to the Kadesh Barnea, to the crossing, and, and we got a new guy in charge. And this new guy's named Joshua, even though they know him, he's never been in charge before. And, here's, and he tells them, he said, look now, uh, what we want you to do is we want you, we've gotten a word from the Lord and we want you to watch a priest. And when a priest put their feet in the water, then the water is going to split like the Red Sea did. And we're going to walk into the promised land on dry ground. And to make things even more frightening, at this time of the year, the Jordan is always flooded out of its banks. And so he says, so when you see the priest get in there, boom, come on, let, let, let's go across there. So now we've got a new leader trying to encourage people to pass over the Jordan River. He's trying, he's trying to get them to do something that he's never even done before. Now he's been across the Jordan River, but it wasn't dried up. And God's instruction is, okay, I'm gonna do it for you. It's a new path it's a, it's, a, it's a new method. It's, it's a new leader. And fear, fear of the unknown, uh, fear of failure, man, it's just paralyzing. It takes guts to get out of the ruts. Everybody say change. I think about Simon Peter. The, he's sitting in a boat, and here's Jesus come walking across the water, and Peter says, if it's you, Lord... Uh, beckon me to come on out there with you. And he said, well, come on. And I can, I, I can imagine Peter when he puts his foot over the edge of that boat 
and that toe touches water, he's probably thinking in his life, this has never happened to me, me before. Well, I know, Peter, because you've never been at the point before where God wanted to work a miracle in your life. But your fear will keep you in the boat because faith takes courage. So your first enemy is tradition. Your second enemy is fear. Let me give you a third one real quick, laziness. Laziness. Whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Change requires effort. What is the four-letter word for effort? Work. A Harvard, a Harvard business professor, John Carter, Cotter, wrote a book called Leading Change. And he said in this book that for a company to change, 15% of its employees must work twice as hard as all the others. This is why so many people never change. This is why marriages don't change. Too much work. This is why jobs don't change. Finances don't change. It feels so much better just to lag back and, and, and be lazy. But the sad conclusion that you should come to is many times it takes twice as much work not to change than it would if you went with the change and moved on with some life. I mean, here's the way the Lord guided Israel in the wilderness. This is Numbers 9, uh, verse 21. So it was... When the cloud remained only from evening until morning, when the cloud was taken up in the morning, then the, they would journey. Whether by day or by night, whether the cloud was taken up, they would journey. All right, more, verse 22. Whether it, listen to this. Whether it was two days, a month, or a year that the glory cloud remained above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey. But then when it was taken up, they would journey. Now, I don't know about you, but it sounds like to me that this glory cloud could move at any whim. That God just was at his own whim when he said, cloud, let's move. And so that means that Israel could not settle down in the, in the wilderness. They had to constantly be thinking to themselves, is that cloud going to move? I mean, it might be there overnight and the next morning, boom, it's moving again. It might be there three months and then before it ever moves. Six days, I mean, uh, two days, a month, a year. I mean, just uh, uh, pff, God could direct that thing to move at any time because God did not want them to get settled down in the wilderness. You know why? Because the wilderness wasn't their home. The promised land was their home. So don't get yourself... To, have you ever... Have any of you ever lived in a tent? And I mean like for uh, a week, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. I know all you military guys have. Uh, but if you've never lived in a tent, man, there is no more temporary way in the world to live than a tent. I mean, it's dirt everywhere. It's inconvenience. It's bugs. It's, uh, you know, it's all... Uh, and they lived in tents for 40 years out on that desert. I mean, just about the time they'd get the tent all set up, you know, and get everything put up and their clothes lying out and the hibachi going and they got a barbecue lizard going out there. And I, all of a sudden, I can just see him now. Dad walks out and that thing, that cloud starts moving. He said, come on, Martha, that cloud's moving again. Let's got to pack it up and follow the cloud. Well, we would take our chance to settle down and not have to move. Anybody would love not to have to move, but God won't allow us to be like that. I mean, I know we say, amen. We say, talking about change and moving on. Amen, that's right. And you've been living in the same house for 50 years. As a matter of fact, I guarantee you, heaven's sakes, that your slippers are probably where they've been for 45 of those 50 years. That's just right there. You don't even have to know. You just walk over there and just slide right into it. <laughs> yeah. Change. I mean, who wants to go to the trouble of this? This is work. This is something. 
Change takes effort, change takes work. Okay, so there are your enemies. You know, you got tradition, then you got fear, then you got laziness. Here's another one real quick, stubbornness. <laughs> stubbornness is an enemy of change. Oh yeah, nevertheless, you're gonna like this. I mean, this is, this, when you see this in the scripture, you'll like this. Because you just see, I mean, I see myself, and I see lots of all of you guys in there too. Um, nevertheless, some of the people went out. All right, you'll, you'll see what that means in a second. All right, God sets up this little test for Israel out in the desert. And if you read the chapter uh, 16, it will tell you this, that God set up a test. This was a test, and it involved manna. And God said, all right, we're going to see how faithful you're going to be to what I tell you to do. So we got this little test for you to pass. And so uh, God brings the quail in at night, twilight, they get quail to eat. In the morning, we got manna. And he says, all right, Moses, tell them now that this manna is going to fall the same way for five days. And on every day... Do not get more manna than your household needs. You get one omer, which I don't know if that's a quart or something. I didn't look all that up. One omer, some amount, for every person in your family. So you go out there in the morning and you get it and you fill up that bucket. You fill, everybody gets a bucket. So everybody gets plenty of this manna to eat. But don't get more than your family requires. And don't try to keep it overnight. And on the sixth day, there's going to be enough manna for you to get two buckets for each person because there won't be any manna on the Sabbath day. So on the, on the day before the Sabbath, you got to get enough to last two days. And I'm going to give you grace and it's going to last. You'll see what he tells him to do and it worked. But nobody, nobody go out there on Sunday and try to get any because there won't be any there or on the Sabbath day. And don't try to get more than enough. All right, now, got that? All right, Moses says, all right, got that? People said, yep, uh, we got it. All right, uh, verse 19, <laughs> Exodus 16. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. And some of them left part of it till morning and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. All right, some of them already showing an exhibition of stubbornness here, right? He just told them, don't leave it, any of it until morning. But some of them couldn't resist. Verse 22, and so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread to Omer's for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, eat that today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now look at this, look at this. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. Hello? He spent four verses telling you, you, get, you said you had. Look, we are creatures of habit. Another word for that is stubborn. And, and it can get in the way of us moving with God. I mean, I've heard people say all my life, one way or another, and it's because I'm a pastor and have been all my life since I was 18, and I promise you, every church I ever went into in my entire lifetime, whether it was a small country church, a big church, a city church, uh, going in a revival or wherever, whatever, when I went in, 
the people would always say, you know, we want our church to be uh, more productive or our church to be more friendly or our church to be more welcoming. Or that and, and that was perfect until you tried to do that. I tell you one time, seriously, one church, one church I was in, I grew that thing in the first year from 63 when I started. There was 63. There was a board in the sanctuary, if any of you have ever been to a Southern Baptist church. There's a board on the wall, and it said, uh, attendance, Sunday school attendance today, 63. So I know how many. That was the first Sunday I was there. 63 people in Sunday school. After the first year, I had grown that booger down to 37. <laughs> I mean, there are some blessed subtractions. I'm, I mean, I'm telling you this. Because they didn't want to, to change. They said they did. But when you did anything, promise you, I, I can't tell you how many conferences I had with people concerned about us clapping to welcome the guest. Hey, if you're visiting with us today, would you stand up? Yeah, yeah, good, oh good. All right, all right, let's make them feel welcome, guys. Just clap like that. Thank you. We got a business card for you, son. That was a big to do right there. Now, yeah, I, I mean, we're not, well, Pastor, we're not going to do that. I said, well, okay, Uncle Flusser, you don't do it. Uh, you don't have to do it. God will get somebody else to do it. God will use somebody else. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to, you don't have to change. But all of these all of these tests, these directions that God gives us. Why did God tell Israel to do this? He, he could have let that manna last a long time, but he didn't. He just said, it ain't gonna last but a day. Don't forget it. And that was a simple direction. Why? Because it says he wanted to test them to see if they would obey him. Lots of directions from God are just simply little tests in life to see if he can trust you with anything small so that he can trust you with something big. You know, the Bible says you've been faithful over a few things. Everybody say little things. And now I can make you ruler over many things, big things, more important things. I mean, look, you are not going to be a prophet to the nations if you can't keep your room clean. I mean, come on. I mean, God, look, look, pay, pay your light bill on time every month and God might move you into some kingdom financing. You've been praying for two years about this tremendously difficult situation in your life. God's got an answer for you. It's down at the church. Where are you? Little things. Can I be faithful over little things? Can I obey God in little things? Because if I can't obey him in little things, he's not going to trust me with bigger things. God can't give you favor with your company and move you up the ladder where you can get raises and promotions if you don't have enough discipline in life to come to work every day on time. Little things. That's just all it boils down to. Stubbornness. Just, just, just stubbornness. And here's the last one. <laughs> Pride. Pride. This is the most deadly of all because this is the one that's most likely to keep you from calling on a Savior for your salvation. Pride. There's none besides me. I'm the greatest. I'm the best. I'm the most. I have arrived. Pride resists change. Why? Because I have to admit the place where I am is not the best place. And after all, somebody as smart as me, somebody as uh, intuitive as me would never be at a place that wasn't the best to start with, so I don't need to go anywhere else because I can't admit that I was at a place that wasn't the best. Let all those people see that. Mm. Isaiah 47, 8. Therefore, hear this now, Isaiah says. You who are given to pleasure, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. Now, this verse is speaking to Babylonian stargazers and Babylonian mystics. But you can, you can hear the word that is used. When I said it, and I kind of said it with a little bit of a, of a break in it, 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 
that is the, the key to this little deal here. It, these stargazers and mystics said, uh, I am. I mean, the devil's behind that. So here's the p little pointy-headed devil uh, saying, I am. Now, there's only one being that has the right to say, I am, and that's God. Because he does, the reason he can say, I am, is because there's no other position for him to be. He, he's not was and he not will be. He just am. God is the only one that just am. I mean, I, where, whatever day it is, whatever week it is, whatever time it is, I, hey, I am. That is God's name. And here's the devil saying to these, uh, leading these stargazers and mystics, and they're claiming that, that, that they are. Now, the spirit behind that is pride. And if you want to get knocked off your, heart, your high horse, just do what the devil did. Because that's exactly what happened. Pride will kill you forever. Pride is the sin most likely to keep you from crying out to a Savior. Jesus told the Pharisees that's why he spent so much time with sinners. He said, look, I came to this world as a doctor to heal people that are sick. And if these people don't think they're sick, they're not going to they're not going to want a doctor. I'm wasting my time. So as seriously dangerous as pride is, it's equally hard to spot because pride infects our eyesight. Uh, it causes us to view ourselves and uh, through some kind of lens that colors reality <laughs> or something. I, I'm going to read this to you. I, I don't often do this, but it, it won't take but a second. Because I found this, and I'm thinking, man, this is just what I would want to say. So I did have to kind of modernize it just a little bit because it was written by Jonathan Edwards. If you've never heard Jonathan Edwards' name before, maybe you've heard of the, the title of his fam fa famous sermon, uh, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. He's an old Puritan worthy. He talked in that old Puritan stuff. So I had to kind of translate it so it would make sense to you. But he, he, he wrote a pamphlet called Seven Sneaky Symptoms of Pride. Well, that's not what he called it, but that's what I call it. He called it undetected pride, but I, seven sneaky symptoms of pride. All right, here they are, real quick. Number one, fault finding. While pride causes us to filter out the evil we see in ourselves, it also causes us to filter out God's goodness in others. We sift them letting only their faults fall into our perception of them. In other words, we judge others by their most glaring weaknesses and we judge ourselves by our best intentions. They know I didn't mean that. Yep, give yourself a break. Number two, a harsh spirit. Now these are seven sneaky signs. You say, am I prideful? I don't think I'm prideful. Well, I... Here, this is what pride is. These are the little things that show you you really are a lot more prideful than you think you are. A harsh spirit. Those who have the sickness of pride in their hearts speak of others' sins with contempt, irritation, frustration, or judgment. Pride is crouching inside our belittling of the struggles of others. It's cowering in our jokes about the craziness of our spouse or our friends. It may even be lurking in the prayers we throw upward for our, for our friends that are subtly or not tainted with exasperated irritation. Just harsh spirit. Here's number three, superficiality. When pride lives in our hearts, we're far more concerned with others' perceptions of us than the reality of our hearts. We fight the sins that have an impact on how others view us and make peace with the ones that no one sees. We have great success in the areas of holiness that have high visible accountability, but little concern for the disciplines that happen in secret. You're superficial. That's pride. Here's one. Defensiveness is number four. Those who stand in the strength of Christ's righteousness alone find a, confidence, uh, find a confident hiding place from the attacks of men and Satan alike. True humility is not knocked off balance and thrown into a defensive posture by challenge or rebuke, but instead continues in doing good and trusting their soul to our faithful Savior. Look, I, I have met people, honestly, 
that it didn't matter the slightest, I mean, even the twinkle of, of, a, of a criticism about anything, they just went into defense mode. I mean, they just would go ballistic on, well, I didn't do that. Well, I would never do that. But that's not what I was talking about. I mean, I mean, and it's just so irritating. It's like, would you quit defending yourself? Nobody's attacking. That's pride that does that. These are seven sneaky symptoms of pride. These are, I mean, there's a whole bunch of outward ones. These are just the ones that hide. Five, number five, disrespect before God. Humility approaches God with humble assurance in Jesus Christ. If either the humble or the assurance are missing in that equation, our hearts very well might be infected with pride. Some of us have no shortage of boldness before God, but if we're not careful, we can forget after all that he is God. Others of us feel no confidence before God which sounds like humility, but in reality, it's another symptom of pride. In those moments, we're testifying that we believe our sins are greater than his grace. We doubt the power of Christ's blood and we're stuck staring at ourselves instead of Christ. Disrespect for God. Number six, desperation for attention. Oh yeah. Pride is hungry for attention, respect and worship in all its forms. Maybe it sounds like shameless boasting about ourselves. Maybe it's being unable to say no to anyone because we need to be needed. Maybe, maybe it looks like obsessively thirsting for marriage or fantasizing about a better marriage because you're hungry to be adored. Maybe it looks like being haunted by your desire for the right car or, or the right house or the right title at work all because you seek the glory that comes from men, not God. Desperation for attention. Last one, neglecting others. Pride prefers some people over others. This is the book of James, by the way. If you've never read it, put some steel-toed uh, boots on and read it because it's going to stomp all over those toes. Pride prefers some people over others. It honors those who the world deems worthy of honor, giving more weight to their words, their wants, and their needs. There's a thrill that goes through me when people with power acknowledge me. We consciously or unconsciously pass over the weak, the inconvenient, the unattractive, because they don't seem to offer us much. Maybe more of us struggle with pride than we thought, there's good news, though, for the prideful because confession of pride signals the beginning of the end for pride because it indicates that the war has already been started. And why would that be true? Because if you feel like that you need to confess your pride and say, God, I'm prideful, forgive me, work with me, I don't want to be this way anymore, that, you, know what, you know who made you feel that way? Not me. All I do is make you mad. The Holy Spirit is the one who did that. He's the only one that can. And he's the only one that can make you want to go to God. So that means he's working in your life. You remember, God is always at work around me. So God, if you see something only God can do, that means God's in it. And God's the one that's doing it. So if you feel that way about any of these things or any other thing in life, it's God doing it. So just, hey, cut the, just cut the pain, cut the, cut the chase, cut the everything, and just agree quickly and go with God because he's the only one that can do that. All right, very good. Um, next week, I think I'll come with uh, seven steps to deal with change or something, whatever, something like that. We'll go, we'll go to the positive side next week, all right? And I'll, I'll bring you some help. I'll bring you some stuff that'll uh, hopefully be helpful in getting us through change. Because God really does, listen, I'm gonna tell you, I've been with the Lord for right at 50 years. And I'm gonna tell you, he's always changing you. He's always changing you, all the time. I can't tell you how many, even opinions and thoughts and things I had nailed down one time in my life that, God's pulled them up and the boards are flapping out there, you know, and I've had to change. Um, 
It's just the way God does. This is the way he works is all I can say. All right, um, if you will, bow your head. Thank you.